welcome to our Wednesday Holy Week devotional. This is the 31st of March and we're right in the middle of the week. This day across the history of the church has been known by many different names. It's been Good Wednesday. It's been known as Spy Wednesday and it's also been known as Holy Wednesday. It's typically a time when we zone in on stories like the story of Mary and Martha. We also look at stories such as Judas and his betrayal of Jesus. But today Anna and myself want to take this opportunity to offer you a new way to think about Holy Wednesday. By turning our attention to the humility of Jesus. But before we do that, let us take a moment in silence and in meditation, quieting our hearts as we draw close to God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we spend this time in worship, it is our prayer that you teach us your way of humility. Teach us to live the way you did, free of piety, free of showing off and help us to shake off any form of glittery faith. Help us to respect others regardless of who they are. Teach us by your word to do the humblest tasks the way you did, with joy and service at heart and in the unhurried quietness of mind. You, Lord, have opened a new and living way that gives the opportunity to experience you and know you. To contemplate the dignity of your holiness, the perfectness of your sacrifice and the blessedness of your mercy. Teach us in your mercy and hear our prayer and help us to serve you. In your name we pray. Amen. The first reading is from Luke chapter 20, verses 45 to 47. While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honour at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. The second reading is from Luke chapter 22, verses 24 to 30. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is the greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel.
You know, before we can ever really learn anything about humility, sometimes we have to, to think about what humility is not. And in the first of our readings today, we get a sense of a tense environment where Jesus has been speaking to all these different people in the crowds, the religious authorities and the ordinary people, including his disciples. And those religious authorities, those elites, those leaders and scribes and teachers of the law would have been feeling the pinch of Christ's teaching here, without a doubt. He's been calling them out about how they have interpreted the scriptures. He's called them out on how they've behaved towards other people, the way they treat each other, the way they treat the poor. The pedestal that they've placed themselves on is gradually being torn down by this person that they see as a would-be messiah. So things in the air is tense. And then Jesus turns from all these crowds of different people to talk to his disciples. Whenever the Bible does that, whenever the scriptures do that, we have to, as Christians, sit up and take note. Because this is Jesus turning away from the public and speaking directly to his disciples. So this is a message directly for us and how we behave. Jesus is going to make clear to us that the behaviour in these Pharisees and the behaviour of these teachers of the law should not and cannot be replicated in the people who follow him. And he goes, you'll notice, into quite a lot of detail about what these people love. Because love as we know, goes to the heart of who we all are. We are what we love. And he sets out that the scribes and the teachers love going around in these flowing robes. They love greeting and meeting people like they're very important in in the marketplaces and in public arenas. They like to be seen, in other words. They love big fancy seats at the synagogue and they like the the best places at the feast table. In other words, these brothers and sisters, these, these, these religious elites are the people who use other people's faith and love for the Lord as a first class ticket into the best places that the world can offer. That's really what Jesus is telling us they are. 
Jesus goes to the heart, in other words, of the thing that contrasts with hum humility itself. This deep ingrained prideful nature that all humans are susceptible to, even us. I think there's just something about the desire to be an elite that Jesus is condemning here specifically. And that ought to be a warning, I think, to the entire church of Jesus Christ this very day. Pride in our positions, pride in what we have, pride in what we do, pride in our qualities and our skills and in the way we preach and the way we talk and the way we sing. If, we've got, if we feel in any way that we are better than somebody else, then pride has got in and it is attacking us. It might be the thing that blocks or becomes a stumbling block rather to other people who want to see Jesus. It might be the thing that drives them away from church. It might be the thing that says, I'm not interested in spending any time with you. You have not lived your faith, so how can I believe it? There's no such thing as a prideful Christian. We have got to refocus ourselves and, and see the world through heaven's eyes. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do here. And the next observation that Jesus makes, the next statement he makes towards the end of, of this reading is very startling. And it's dire, really. Jesus claims that these prideful, elitist, religious authorities devour women's and widows' houses. They're directing their conversation to women who in that time were second-class citizens, sadly. Very, very real heart issue for the church because this is about economy. He's attacking the religious officials here based on how they see their economic wealth. He's seeing how the religious authorities befriend these widows, not just widows, it will be some of the poorest and some of the most infirm and the weakest in society. They befriend them to extract from them money to use for their own lifestyles. This is economic neglect of the faithful, pious neglect of the family. In Jesus' eyes, these widows are to be cared for by the church, but these religious authorities are not caring for them. And actually, it's one of the marks of a humble church, isn't it? How we steward our money, how we give and how we receive. And what Jesus is doing here is, as I said before, it's attacking the heart. He goes to the very core of what it takes to be a Christian. Not to destroy it, but to call it out. Because Easter time, like this, is about death and resurrection. Just as Jesus died and rose again, he calls us to put to death these things in our heart that drive us to these behaviours. The way we speak about the vulnerable, the way we treat the poor. The way that we attack the holiness of God, the way we neglect our faith. The way we draw people away from the throne of God. And put them all in the grave. And prepare ourselves, prepare each other for a new day. For a new resurrected self. One that is free from these pangs of sinfulness and worldliness. And one that looks straight ahead to the radiant purity of his glory. Amen. Consider Christ the source of our salvation that he should take
should trust his father in the garden of Gethsemane. Though full of dread and fearful of the anguish, he drank the cup that was reserved for Some thoughts on Luke chapter 22, verses 24 to 30. So here we have the situation where Jesus has shared the Passover meal with his disciples, those who have been with him during his ministry of heralding in the new kingdom of God, a kingdom of love and forgiveness. Jesus had just shared the bread and wine and told his friends that he is about to be betrayed and to suffer. You possibly expect that Jesus' friends would be a bit shaken. Surely this cannot happen to Jesus. Or maybe expect them to be stunned and unable to take in all that Jesus had just told them. In the other Gospels, we hear that the disciples want to know who was going to betray Jesus and find out it will be Judas Iscariot. But only in Luke's Gospel do we hear. Also, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. So, were the disciples more concerned about their own status, now that they knew it was Judas Iscariot who would betray Jesus, rather than being concerned about what Jesus was soon going to go through? I suppose it's a common human frailty, thinking, well, what about me? Jesus replies by explaining how the important people in authority on earth react when they have power over others. He tells them, they lord it over them and call themselves benefactors. They might want to give the impression that they care for others, but never do that at the expense of seeming less powerful. Seems like some things haven't changed much in 2,000 years. Jesus tells his disciples in verse 26, you are not to be like that. He tells them they have to turn the tables on society's ideas. We have to serve, just as Jesus did. We read in Philippians chapter 2 verse 6, Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing. Jesus didn't put himself on a pedestal for all to see and admire. He came to serve. 
Of course, the trouble with us is that we like a bit of praise and admiration. It makes us feel good. And a bit of praise and admiration and encouragement is fine now and again. But when we want to be put on a pedestal and stay there for all to see, then we're not following the way of Jesus. So what do we need to do? How can we be humble, truly humble? Let me share something personal with you. Some of you will know that I have a sister who's disabled. And right now at this time of lockdown, I've taken over her carer duties. I go two or three times a week to help my sister have a shower. Now, I know that some mornings I think to myself, oh, I don't really want to go this morning. But then a wee voice comes into my head asking, well, would you like to change places with your sister? And of course, the answer is a resounding no. For us to be humble, we need to understand as best we can how another person is feeling. Understand the circumstances that they are in. And if possible, empathise. Not criticise that person for being in their current situation. No one has asked me to change places with my sister. Only to be ready to assist her with the things she needs. But let's look at what Jesus has done for us. He didn't, didn't just come to save us by understanding us and trying to help our situation improve a wee bit. He did take our place. Nor did he just appear as a man to encourage and teach us the way of the new kingdom. He came to us as a helpless baby who could do nothing for himself so that he experienced all that we experience and so be a saviour who knows how we feel, knows how we hurt, knows how we struggle sometimes. He took our place, not just as a baby or a young boy or a man, but also as the one who was punished for our sins. He did change places with us. We should have been given the punishment for our sin, but because of Jesus' sacrifice, we can go free and know that the punishment has been given to him. So let's all remember just how much Jesus has done for us and let us try to be humble. Let us go out and understand the needs of those we meet and try our best to meet those needs whenever possible. In that way, we will one day eat and drink at the Lord's table in his kingdom and enjoy his presence forever. A poem. Lord, take me off my pedestal, my pious stand of conceit. Bring me down off of it and put me at your feet. From there, let me look, look up to only you. Let not my own pride be in anything more I do. Lord, take my self-worth, knock it to the ground. Help me to see in myself there's no good to be found. Let me stay on my knees until I come to recognise how my haughtiness is just rebellion in disguise. Lord, take me off my pedestal, rid me of my vanity. Let me stay at your feet till I am filled with humility.
Glory to God the Father, and, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it was in the beginning, in the beginning is, now, is now, and, and ever, ever shall, shall be, world, world without, without end. end. Amen. Amen.